Thanks very much, Carol. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I'm calling in from uh, a rather chilly South Africa, sort of early evening for me. Um, I know we've got a lot of people in the US, a couple of people in Europe. Um, so hopefully you've all had a good day up until now and uh, you're looking forward to the presentation. So the purpose of, or shall I say, the, the topic that we're going to talk about today is really looking at um, understanding forensic science as a concept within broader digital forensics and, uh, you know, trying to bring all of these uh, disparate disciplines together under a single roof so we all uh, understand what we're looking at. So uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I have been working in digital forensics for the last 21 years. Uh, so I feel like a real um, uh, almost fossil in the, the digital forensics industry. Um, the, sort of the first 17 of which were basically working in law enforcement, um, you know, running everything from uh, sort of uh, large fraud investigations where, where digital evidence was involved right the way through to kidnappings, murders, um, and then spent a lot of time working uh, cybercrime cases, uh, hacking incidences and things like that. Um, I've spent a lot of time in court testifying and, and that sort of um, put me in an interesting position to see how uh, digital forensics has kind of um, specialized itself uh, into sort of an incident response role, looking at how do we deal with incidents and hacks and things along those lines that are not going to court and then those matters that also end up do going to court and understanding the role that forensic science plays um, in that. Um, I've been teaching for SANS now for the last six years. Um, I currently teach uh, 4500, which is our uh, Windows Forensic Analysis course, and the 4500, which is our Advanced uh, Forensics Incident Response and Threat Hunting course. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today uh, touches on both of these courses and how uh, these courses actually help enhance the forensic science process. Um, I'm quite comfortable to say that I still get a thrill from catching bad guys um, and girls. I, I can't be accused of being sexist in the process. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, obviously to, to catch the kind of bad guys and, and bad girls we're looking at in these kind of advanced hacks, we need to be quite um, comfortable with a lot of forensic science principles so that we could use them effectively in court. And uh, it would be quite fair for me to say that I am unashamedly a nerd, a uh, big science and tech nerd. I, I love all things um, geeky, all things nerdy. I love science. Uh, and let's not get into the debate of which is better, Star Wars or Star Trek, because I think they're both good. So with that, a little bit about me, let's move into the meat and potatoes of the presentation. So... Um, a lot of times when we talk about uh, digital forensics or incident response, we sort of constantly go around, throw around this term evidence. And evidence means a lot of things to different people. Um, you know, if you're an IT auditor, for example, uh, the type of evidence that we talk about is the, the stuff that supports your audit findings. Um, if you're doing an incident response matter, the evidence that you're looking at is the facts and the pieces of data that actually help um, point to a particular vulnerability that was compromised or a mechanism, a tool, tactic or procedure that the bad guys use to get into the network. And then obviously, if you're doing digital forensics, um, you know, evidence might invariably be something that you're going to be used either in a, a court case because it's a disciplinary, uh, like a criminal matter, or you're using it in some kind of misconduct hearing against an employee or staff member, or even potentially using it in civil litigation where either the company that you work for is suing somebody else, or ironically, somebody is suing your, uh, your company. And um, that, that's kind of a big thing at the moment, especially in Europe with GDPR and some of those things. We look at the recent fines that, um, uh, that have been imposed in, in the UK, for example. I think it does make us think that sometimes evidence does come into play in, in broader spheres rather than just the criminal realm. So, so when we understand the importance of evidence, um, it largely depends on 
what our focus is. But generally, evidence is uh, those artifacts, those um, pieces of data that we extract from the systems that we investigate uh, that help us identify key issues or support key issues, our hypotheses in our investigation. Um, effectively, the best way I can think of it, think of evidence as the building blocks on a big Lego set um, that helps you put all of these pieces together to build a kind of a Lego um, masterpiece. Now, on the basis of it, um, just having uh, evidence uh, in the investigation phase is fine, but it really comes into its play if we ever move into a judicial phase. Um, and this is where we end up going to court or there's some kind of uh, misconduct hearing within our organizations, uh, you know, where we're taking disciplinary action against somebody, uh, or we're contemplating legal action civilly, either against a third party or a party is taking action against our organization. Now, no matter which process we follow, um, all of these judicial phases make um, extensive use of evidence. Um, in fact, no judicial findings can actually be made without evidence. So, so evidence actually becomes quite a critical uh, component for us in our investigations to actually show um, that we've proved our case, uh, you know, for that judicial uh, process. Now, in terms of proving a case, and I'm using this kind of um, loosely because how we prove our case will depend on our proposed outcome. Uh, so, for example, if we are potentially looking at a, a civil matter um, where there's civil litigation be cons considered, uh, generally we have to try and prove our case uh, on a balance of probabilities. Um, if we're looking at potentially a criminal matter, we're looking at proving our case uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. And on a disciplinary matter, generally it uses the civil uh, frames um, of evidence uh, beyond, you know, being able to prove something on a balance of probability. But, but in proving a case, I mean, besides the, the burden of proof that we have to satisfy in court, we also need to look at the different elements that have to be present in any investigation that, we, that we're investigating and how do we put all these pieces together. Um, you know, people have often said to me in an investigation, it's like putting together a massive jigsaw puzzle. Now, in most jigsaw puzzles, if you think about it, you have you know, a 5,000 piece jigsaw puzzle and uh, you generally have a picture on the box of that jigsaw puzzle that you can start putting all the pieces together and you can match individual jigsaw puzzle pieces up to pieces uh, on the picture and you can build up the jigsaw puzzle from there. However, when you're doing the kind of investigations we often do, you know, especially if we're talking about an incident response match or things along those lines, what we end up having is not a 5,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. We have, you know, a 5 million piece jigsaw puzzle or even more. And we've got to put all of those pieces together in such a way that we get a complete picture. The only problem is we don't have a picture on a box to guide our, our processes. So, so we, need to, we need to put this picture together um, in a more sort of pragmatic way using principles and processes. And that's generally where forensic science comes in. But effectively, um, if you think about it, uh, the, the sort of what we call the crime the crime scene triad uh, or this ability to put uh, all of the pieces together um, really, really relies on bringing three things together. Um, effectively, we have the first thing which I'll talk about is the incident scene. Um, and that's basically where the bad stuff's happened. Um, so for, for example, if I look at a network that's been compromised, that would be all the machines, all the devices on the network that have been compromised um, in a hack. And being able to identify uh, those compromised devices and identify the compromised files or systems on them, that effectively becomes our incident scene. The second thing, obviously, we need to look at is tying it back to our victim. Now, for most of the investigations, we do the incident scene and the victim are almost synonymous. Um, but it's still important to, to, to see, for example, on an incident scene that we might have vict specific victim accounts. Um, you know, for example, who are the hackers actually going after? Um, and and this, this might sound uh, trivial, but if you think about it, uh, most hacks, especially APTs and those type of things, are not random events. You know, we don't have hackers just randomly sort of scanning the internet looking for 
uh, weak ports or, or vulnerabilities and, you know, just, well, oh, I'm just going to randomly hack some, some system for no particular reason. Uh, you know, that, that, might, that might work well for the script kiddies and the sort of low level, um, if I like to refer to them as hobbyist hackers or opportunity hackers. But the real hackers are, are actually hacking a system for a reason, which means that they are going after a particular victim. Now, this might be a particular division within a company. It might be actual individuals within a company, but they, they're after something. Um, and being able to tie the scene where the crime goes down to the actual victim and understanding how these things fit together is quite critical. And then the third part of this triad is being able to tie the suspect uh, to the offense. Now, um, I am not naive enough to turn around and say, well, you know, we can track every single suspect and we can do uh, suspect attribution and identify that it was Mr. X that committed the hack. Um, in many instances, we can't do that. Um, at the best we could do is identify a location that the hack came from or compromised accounts or things along those lines, uh, especially when the hacks are coming from uh, foreign countries where we have no legal process to obtain that information. But in many instances, we can also identify a suspect and we can put, sort of put those things together. At the end of the day, it's the evidence that we have of the system that actually brings these three elements together. And we need to bring all three elements together um, to be able to prove our cases. And if we don't do that, then fundamentally we're missing the big picture when it comes to, uh, to uh, digital evidence. Now, now, there are a lot of definitions of forensic science, and I want to sort of pause here for a moment to say, well, why talk about bringing or understanding the role of forensic science in, in digital forensics? Um, and I think it's also partly historical to have this discussion. Uh, when I started in digital forensics in the sort of um, mid-90s, um, the discipline was just kind of getting together. And, and I think a lot of my fellow SANS instructors and, and forensic practitioners around the world that have been doing this for a while will probably agree with me. Um, we, we were kind of figuring things out as it went along. Uh, most of us were... Um, especially those of us in law enforcement were investigators. We, we, we were the nerds of the units that we worked at, you know, um, and uh, in, a, in a sort of world of rough, tough law enforcement, we were the people that got called upon when suddenly a case came in that had a computer. Um, remembering back in those days, most people were not exactly 100% uh, computer literate. Computers in the home were still a rarity. So, you know, we, we had to kind of figure things on, on the ground. And as, as we developed the discipline, it was very much an investigative discipline. It, it, it had no real basis in uh, forensic science. Uh, we, we tried to do things scientifically, if I can put it that way, but, but we, never, we never considered ourselves at that point, I would say, a defined forensic science. But as digital forensics has evolved over the years, um, more and more institutions, more and more organizations, have accepted the fact that digital forensics has evolved into a forensic science. And uh, if you look at efforts uh, through organizations like uh, the Association of Chief Police Officers in the United Kingdom, or the Scientific Working Group for Digital Evidence in the US, as well as um, efforts by the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the US, as well as the US Department of Justice, um, we've seen a definite move towards uh, the embracing of forensic science within the digital forensics process. Uh, now that's not to say that, that uh, digital forensics must always be a forensic science. For example, if we look at incident response instances, that's not always going to be the case. Um, but a lot of forensic science principles can still in, uh, enhance the incident response processes as well. Um, probably the biggest, um, I could suppose a driver in the United States uh, towards the embracing of digital forensics as a forensic science has uh, been work that's been conducted by the National Academy of Science in the United States, um, especially the, the National Academy of Sciences report on forensic science um, in the United States itself. So we've definitely seen a move towards a more scientific basis for our um, investigative activities. So there are a number of different definitions for, for what forensic science is. 
And uh, I'm certainly not going to try and define, you know, any of the hundreds of different definitions, but I've put together a definition that, that kind of makes sense from a practical point of view. And, and basically, it's any time that we sort of examine or evaluate or analyze sort of evidence. And, and the way we do that analysis is we basically use scientifically validated and approved methodologies. Um, and, and, and basically, we do that in the context of a particular scientific discipline, in, in this instance, computer science. And effectively, we're then using that investigation to answer some kind of legal or paralegal question. You know, uh, was a person guilty? Was a person innocent? Um, was a organization negligent with regards to their security that allowed a hack to take place? Um, these are the kind of questions that we will ask uh, when we look at a forensic science approach. Now, a key thing that I want to point out here is this concept of scientifically validated methodologies. Now, um, while not universally applied uh, around the world, um, there has been precedent case, uh, case law in, in the United States. Um, so, for example, the Daubert test, which is often used uh, when testifying, um, that the methods that you use have to be peer accepted, peer reviewed, and things along along those lines. So, so this is very important that when we're doing our our forensics, uh, our digital forensics, uh, if we want it to be scientifically valid, we we've got to use accepted methodologies, um, and we can't just sort of uh, invent things as we go. Now, that's not to say that we can't try new methods. We just need to be in a position where we can comfortably document our findings and make those open to peer review. Um, and another interesting thing when it comes to the approach of digital forensics is there has to be a level of um, scientific openness. Um, we often have the situation, and, and I'm, I'm probably not the most popular person for saying this, but some vendors will come with the sort of magic bullet or the black box approach and plug this in and get an output on the other side and you never ever understand how it works or what it does. Um, that's kind of completely against the, the practice, the scientific practice in forensic science where everything should be understood so it can be tested. Um, and and that, that is very problematic for, for us. And, you know, we sometimes have issues with vendors who are not prepared to sort of um, open up to their, their secret source that they use, and then they wonder why, um, you know, there are problems in court. Um, the second thing that I want to focus on, <coughs> pardon me, is a lot of forensic science is around um, uh, scientific disciplines. Now, when it comes to digital forensics, the most prevalent scientific disciplines are either computer science or, or computer engineering or electronics engineering. Um, now, again, that's not necessarily to say that you should have a degree in those in those fields. It certainly might help um, in a court perspective, but it's not the alpha and the omega. Um, but why, why it's important to talk about this is oftentimes when people get into the digital forensics realm, um, you know, they, they'll go and do one or two uh, sort of um, vendor-led courses on how to do digital forensics, you know, use a particular tool or a particular methodology. Um, and that's, you know, they don't necessarily understand what they're doing at the back end, how things work. And this is one of the things uh, that I can say from a, from a SANS perspective, where we do digital forensics and we teach digital forensics, it's less about the tools that we teach you to use. The tools are just a means to an end. But what we do teach is to understand the different artifacts and how things work, which technically means that if you wanted to, you could write and code your own tools to do those things if you understand what the artifacts are that we're looking for. And, and that for me is quite important because that also talks to meeting the scientific agenda that, that we're looking at. So, if, if I look at forensic science in general as it's evolved over the years, and, and I, I do say it has evolved over the years because, you know, up until the sort of mid-1980s, sort of, uh, um, you know, forensic science was kind of a hit and miss affair. Um, you know, it was, you know, it's almost akin to a bit of uh, butchery in some instances. Um, but during the early years, uh, 
uh, especially in France, the sort of medical fraternity made big inroads into developing the kind of scientific methodologies that we use today in our investigations. And sort of since the early 1900s, right the way through now to the 21st century, forensic science has evolved at quite a, a pace um, to, to allow us to objectively conduct investigations with a scientific basis meaning that the findings that we make are a lot more sound, they're a lot more reputable, um, and they give us a lot more value uh, in whatever sort of whatever mechanism that we use them. So uh, if I look at forensic science, um, probably the, the father of forensic science uh, to many people is a French uh, physician by the name of Edmund Lacard. Um, who developed effectively the first principle in forensic science, which was the Lacard principle. And uh, it was that basis that gave rise to two United States criminal, uh, criminalists um, uh, 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 Edmund, the, that basically led to the Edmund Rubin principles and par uh, processes, um, which then basically expanded on what Lacard had done and developed additional processes. And these principles and processes have now become the bedrock of uh, forensic science. And when, when we go through these now, you'll see how these, how these principles and processes intimately tie into the digital forensics process as well, uh, meaning that they actually give a lot of scientific credence to what we do as, as digital forensicators. So the first principles that we have is the principle of transfer and then the visibility of matter. Um, and I'll go through these in more detail in the next slide. And then the, we have four processes, which is basically identification, classification and individualization, association and reconstruction. So the first principle, and probably, as I may mention, the golden principle in forensic science is what we call the principle of transference. Now, now this is also known uh, as sort of respectfully as the Lacard principle after Edmund Lacard that postulated it. But basically, it is whenever two objects come into contact with each other, there's a reciprocal transfer of information. Now, uh, I always like to use real-world forensic analogies when I'm when I'm teaching uh, my SANS classes, and and it'll be quite appropriate um, in that sense. But but just imagine. Um, I went and shook any one of your hands now. You know, I was meeting you in person and I, I gave you a nice hefty handshake. Um, just think about what happens at that point of contact when we shake each other's hands. Um, the sort of vigorous motion of us shape, shaking each other's hands is going to rub off epithelial skin cells. So, you know, um, I'll have a part of you on me and you'd have a part of me on you. I know it's kind of gross, but you know, this is forensics. It would be forensics if it wasn't a little bit of grossness involved. Um, but at the same token, there'd be a transfer of, of sweat. Uh, sweat from my hand would pass onto your hand. Sweat from your hand would pass onto my hand. And as our fingers curled uh, to embrace the back of each other's hands in the handshake motion, we'd have also left fingerprints on the back of each other's hands. Now, that in a nutshell kind of is what uh, the principle of transference is. And basically it means that I can show that something had interacted with something else. And if you think back to the evidence tried that we spoke about earlier, it's those kind of interactions that we want to be able to prove. So I want to be able to prove that a suspect account on a compromised machine had logged on to another machine on the network. Um, being able to prove that interaction is a core example of this transference uh, principle. Um, and if you think about it, uh, the whole basis of how computers work is the principle of transfer. Uh, so uh, another simple example that, that in, this is sort of what illustrates this, um, when I first connect to a network, um, the first thing that happens is my inter network interface card basically broadcasts uh, itself and will connect to a DHCP server. Um, when that uh, uh, network interface card on my computer, on my laptop, uh, talks to the DHCP server, the first thing that happens is uh, the network interface card on my computer transmits or broadcasts its MAC address to the DHCP server the DHCP server records that MAC address, but at the same token, the DHCP server is communicating with my computer and I'm recording details of the DHCP server on that. 
and the DHCP server then assigns me an IP address to communicate on that network, which is stored on my computer. So, so there is this reciprocal transfer of information from from one to the other. Uh, in fact, that transfer is the core of everything we do on compu in computing. Um, it's all about the communication of information, and this is where that, that information becomes absolutely critical. Um, the second thing that we do from a forensic science point of view is uh, the principle of the divisibility of matter. Now, in the world of physical forensics, this means that if I have a sample of something, uh, let's say a sample of blood, um, I can extract a small sample of that blood to do tests against it, and, and the, the findings that I make in that small, small sample, um, I can impute to the entire whole. And uh, that's fine in the world of physical forensics, but it doesn't kind of work in digital forensics because if I take a few bytes of a file and look at that, I can't, I can't sort of extrapolate the whole file from a few bytes. But but where the divisibility of matter does apply when it comes to digital forensics is the fact that because any piece of data that we investigate, whether it be a file, whether it be a fragment of a file, whether it be a few clusters um, on a hard drive uh, or pages in memory, uh, each structure is fundamentally nothing more than a mathematical number. It's simply a binary string of numbers uh, that we can replicate as many times as we want and every time that we replicate it it will be an identical replication and and what do I mean by this if I have the number 1213 1213 will always be 1213 it doesn't matter how many million times I write it down the number still remains the same number and that's what we could do with digital forensics, that we can we can duplicate these data artifacts for testing. So not, nothing that we do um, will ever destroy the evidence if we handle it correctly, because we have the ability to completely and continuously replicate that evidence physically as many times as we need to, to perform whatever tests we need on the evidence without ever compromising the integrity or the originality of that um, of that evidence and and those are really the two fundamental principles that we have in forensic science um, now again just just to sort of illustrate another example of the Lacard principle uh, you know and this is something that we teach on in the 4500 course where we start to look at USB device usage um, we can show you how uh, the mere plugging in of a USB device into a laptop or a computer on a Windows system leaves trace evidence which shows proof of that connection, shows proof of the connection of that device. Um, but we can also show it from the other side where we can show how transfers have potentially been accessed off that device, how files are being copied onto that device. Um, all sorts of things that shows that interaction. You know, something from the USB device uh, which is either the serial number from the device or the name of the volume on the device is transferred over to the computer and vice versa. And this is the type of stuff that, that from, a, from a forensic point of view, allows us to actually um, pull all of these things together and show, once again, how that evidential triad comes into being. Um, so I'm not just finding stuff, I'm actually interpreting how the stuff works and and that interpretation leads me into the next section um, uh, of the webcast which basically looks at the the four forensic science principles now the four forensic science principles basically build on the um, the process the, 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 the sorry the the four forensic science processes build on the two forensic science principles and and each one kind of takes the analysis up a step. So the first forensic science process that we apply is the process which we call identification. Now, I know this might seem trivial, but it's, it's about um, identifying what the thing is. Like, do you know what you're looking at kind of, kind of uh, thing? Um, I remember as a, as a sort of very young uh, detective, uh, going through my detective training, uh, you know, walking into mock crime scenes and seeing a red substance on the floor and making the mistake of just saying, hold on, wait a minute, there's in my notes that there's blood on the floor. 
um, you know, for, for my academy instructors to turn around to me and say, well, how do you know it's blood? Um, at that point, I knew it was a red substance. But I, I, did, I couldn't make that leap to say it was blood. I needed to go through an identification process. And, and a lot of forensics is actually about that. You, you, you see something, we observe something with our eyes or, or we hear something with our ears or, or we feel something uh, with, with our physical senses. But we still need to identify that. What is this thing? And that often applies uh, in digital forensics. In fact, it's almost the core of what we do in digital forensics is to actually identify what it is we're looking at. Um, you know, starting really, really, really at the most basics, you know, what kind of file system are we looking at? Um, you know, is it a NTFS file system? Is it a, you know, XFAT file system? Is it a APFS file system on a Mac? Um, and the reason we need to understand those file system structures is if we understand the file system structures we can identify them, we can identify different artifacts and different uh, components within those structures. Um, it's about identifying uh, individual artifacts. You know, this is the registry. Uh, this is a PST, you know, with an email store. Uh, these are pictures. These are documents. These are event logs. Um, and it's important to identify identify these things and know exactly what they are because when it comes to analysis of those things if we misidentify them uh, the tools that we use in the analysis may give us incorrect um, results uh, so for example just I'll use an example of a, a case that I'd worked on many many years ago which sort of illustrated this principle um, we had worked on an investigation where uh, um, another another entity, I, I was still working in law enforcement this time, um, another entity, a private sector entity had been brought in to examine a number of computers um, on a fairly large scale corruption investigation, uh, procurement corruption investigation. And the the company that had done the forensic analysis of these computers had, had pretty much used a well-known forensic tool and um, based on what that tool had told them, had turned around and said, um, okay, there's, you know, we find no relevant emails in this investigation. Now, th the problem comes in is when we got the evidence to review that, uh, we contacted the organization to get their findings. And, you know, we, we were basically told, hey, you know, you guys don't waste your time. You know, you're wasting taxpayers' money to even look at these computers. There's no evidence on them. And that was problematic because the, the only evidence that they gave us to say that there was no evidence on the computer was the reports from their forensic tool to say that that had been the case. Um, we knew that there had to be email communications on, this, uh, on these devices. Um, and it was simply a matter of not relying on the forensic tool, but actually relying on an understanding of the systems and the architecture of the systems and the programs that have been installed to see what should have been there. And what actually happened is that these particular computers had been using uh, Novell GroupWise um, and uh, they were using Novell GroupWise email. And unfortunately, uh, the tool that the company had been using just simply didn't have the ability to pass out uh, GroupWise emails. Uh, so when they ran the tool and they processed the evidence, the email um, tab pretty much came up saying there's no, there's no emails here. That for me is problematic. And this is why identification is so critical. You can't do an investigation without identifying what's on there because once you've identified what's on there, you can then select the appropriate tools because we identified that they had been using Novell GroupWise and they were using uh, Novell GroupWise for the email, we could then procure an appropriate forensics tool that would allow us to pass out that information and we were able to recover all of the emails and prove the case um, beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and that leads me into the next uh, forensic science process, which is basically classification and individualization. And that's, and that's basically proving uh, the uniqueness of something or, or being able to classify something as a particular type of evidence. Um, you know, if you ever end up finding yourself going to court, uh, being able to say what a piece of evidence is and what it means uh, actually kind of counts. Um, and there's two ways that we can look at classification and individualization. Well, firstly, when it comes to classification, um, you could do broad classifications. And I'll, I'll talk about a classification scheme that I've been working on as part of my PhD research. Um, but you can look at a broad classification scheme 
Um, or you can look at uh, a classification scheme, which is as simple as uh, this is a JPEG file, this is a EVTX file, this is a prefetch file, this is a um, uh, um, an LNK file. Uh, being able to understand all of these files uh, means we know what what they could do. In other words, what are those files of? What are they for? Um, what relevance do they have on the system? A key part of what we do in the Windows, uh, the, the 4500 course uh, that we teach at SANS, is we really go into in depth into all of, a whole bunch of different Windows artifacts where we can classify these artifacts so that, that the examiner, the forensicator, can look at these artifacts and see exactly what they mean. Um, they can interpret those artifacts to see how they actually put together the jigsaw puzzle that we're investigating. Um, and that's something that is incredibly, I find to be incredibly valuable uh, from a forensics point of view. Um, the second part of the classification uh, process, if I could put it that way, is the process of individualization. Um, we wanted to show the uniqueness of things. Now, um, I know a lot of people still turn around and say, um, especially from a cryptographic point of view, MD5 and SHA-1 and all these uh, one-way hashes are all bad and they're cryptographically weak. I understand that and I take, um, I take acknowledgement of that fact and I don't disagree with it when we're looking at it from a cryptographic point of view. But, we, but when we're looking at proving uh, a digital fingerprint or, or a signature for a particular individual file, uh, one-way hashing is a great way to show individualization. And what do I mean by this? Well, if I have a case where people are um, exfiltrating information or stealing information from a system, so let's just say I have uh, an employee working in an organization who um, logs onto a network share, and I've, I've done lots of cases like this uh, where that happens, um, you know, connects to a network share, copies a whole, a whole bunch of information, puts it on a, a thumb drive and tries to sneak it out the organization. Um, the fact that we can, through court action or Anton Pillar orders, identify and recover those thumb drives or external hard drives that have that information on, and we can prove that the files that they have on their side are exactly the same as the files that came from the organizations we're doing the investigations for, shows that it's exactly the same file. In other words, there's no other way they could have created this file or come about this file unless they'd actually physically copied it and taken it with them. So, so when it comes to data theft and things along those lines, um, it's a really, really great uh, way for us to show or prove what has actually happened. Now, um, I just want to talk quickly about this because this is often something that, that catches people out when it comes to doing digital forensics. Um, and this is probably maybe uh, um, sort of revision for most of the audience. But, but when we talk about classification and individualization, we also need to understand the different parts of data. Um, you know, so for example, the fact that uh, we have a file and that the file name of the file doesn't necessarily form part of the file um, means that we actually have to identify two different data structures. So for example, if we were looking on a Windows machine on the NTF file system, we'd be looking in the master file table record to find the details of a file, such as the file name, when it was created, uh, the SID that owns the file, and so forth. Um, we'd be actually be looking at the file itself to identify the contents of the file. And we could go one step further and look at internal file metadata as well, uh, which is, you know, for example, um, EXIF data on a photo and so forth. Again, all stuff that we sort of go into quite in depth in the, the Windows Forensics course. But these concepts that we deal with, these are part of that classification and individualization process. Now, I just want to touch on, on this model that I've been working on um, as part of my PhD, and I, I have presented it previously at the DFIR Summit in Prague. Um, but basically, uh, we often need to prove, uh, from a forensic science point of view, what type of evidence that we're dealing with. And, and when we look at um, uh, digital evidence, evidence specifically, we really have three broad classification categories. So the first category is our physical media. Um, in other words, the, the hard drive, the SSD uh, that we get data from. 
Um, and also part of physical media, I consider our transmission media. So whether it be Wi-Fi or data going across a cable, um, there is still a physicalness to that, whether it be radio waves, whether it be um, you know, light uh, uh, sort of uh, photons moving through uh, fiber optic cable, there is still a physicalness to that. And then we have our two core, our core classifications. Um, the first is logical evidence, and, and this pretty much means evidence that, that still exists as part of the file system, but in other words, not deleted data. Uh, or should say not deleted data, not deleted uh, files, because a, a, a intact file could contain deleted data, for example, like deleted registry keys or deleted emails, um, which could still exist with inside that file. And then we have uh, the other broad category, which is our trace digital evidence. So that's pretty much uh, where we recover data, but we need to put the data together to actually get some kind of evidential um, value out of that, um, and then obviously, obviously, we could then we can then uh, ratchet that down even further to sort of file system artifacts, uh, where we look at evidence on the file system level, op operating system artifacts, uh, application artifacts, and then user artifacts. But this is the kind of uh, way that we will apply forensic sciences processes within the digital forensics um, domain. And then the last two processes that I want to uh, talk about before um, I'll open up for, for questions, if anybody's got any questions, is probably for me the two most important processes that we actually use uh, in, in digital forensics. Now, um, I, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of different agencies and organizations around the world providing digital forensic services and seeing how a lot of digital forensics um, is done around the world. And for most people, when they think of digital forensics, they think of the following scenario. Um, uh, they task an investigator to go and image computers. Um, the investigator images those computers, uh, processes the evidence with a list of keywords supplied by the, the one party, uh, then puts all of the hits from those keywords onto a searchable hard drive and gives it back to them. And then they sort of pat, the, pat themselves on the back and say what wonderful digital forensics they've done. Um, and, and if you look at a lot of cases, especially in law enforcement, um, this is kind of what the status quo has been for many, many years. It's a lot better when it comes to incident response matters because obviously in incident response matters, we need to have a better understanding of what's happened in the system. We need to do root cause analysis, which means we can't just find stuff. We've actually got to interpret stuff and explain stuff. Um, but even there, we could see better use of forensic science processes uh, to actually tell the whole story. Now, um, it, it might sound uh, sort of simplistic, but but forensic science and digital forensics and even incident response for that matter is creating a narrative. It's, it's telling a story. Um, I still remember uh, a couple of years ago listening to Rob Lee, the, the, the sort of uh, digital forensics uh, fellow, uh, faculty lead for the SANS Institute, um, talking about conversational forensics, you know, being able to talk forensics. And, and I'd always like to take it a step further and say it's not just about talking about forensics and having a common understanding of the processes and the artifacts, but it's about telling the story. Um, we need to tell the story of what's happened. We need to show to another party what's taken place. And that's really what forensics is about. It's telling a story of what's happened in the past, um, almost like digital archaeologists, for lack of a better term. So the two processes that we will often apply there is the process of association, which is basically trying to find linkages between uh, two things. Now, that can mean links between two files. It could be a link between a file and a hard drive. It could be uh, you know, connections from an event log to a machine, to a file, to all sorts of things. Um, this is really an extension of the Lacard principle, the transference principle, but it's where we can make concrete associations between two things and literally say, um, this, this, this artifact and this artifact have come into contact with each other and this is what this means. And that association could be an incredibly powerful um, tool. 
But, but where digital forensics uh, really comes into its own from a forensic science point of view is this concept of reconstruction. Now, if we are going to tell a story of what's happened, we need to be able to quite clearly articulate what has taken place on a system. It's not just good enough to say, well, we found these artifacts and, and, and this is how they've interacted. But when we can order those associations in time and space, so when we can put them in a timeline, um, and again, this is something we do touch on in 4.500, but we also do extensively in 4.508, um, is the ability to actually build a comprehensive forensic timeline of everything that's happened on a system. Now, now this is this is quite valuable for us, and, and I'll tell you why. Having done investigations for most of my career, um, the one thing that I can tell you is that human witnesses are increasingly unreliable. Uh, we rely on eyewitness accounts, we rely on our own observations, and sorry to say, but they are quite flawed. Now, the nice thing with digital forensics and digital evidence in particular is we have a wealth of date and timestamps um, that can help us to reconstruct um, associations in a sequence within time. Now, I'm pretty sure there's going to be people uh, listening today or, or listening later um, uh, going through this webcast saying, but hold on, wait a minute, what about uh, anti-forensics tools? What about uh, creating, you know, uh, sort of manipulating timestamps on files or backdating system clocks. Well, think about the Lacard principle. Every single action like that leaves a footprint on the system. And those footprints on the system we can use to show uh, those kind of events. And we can build that into our reconstruction to help present the narrative of the case that we're looking at. And, and those are the kind of things that we need to look at from a a forensic science point of view. So, so I, I've pretty much uh, run the gamut from, you know, sort of starting out at the core of what forensic science is and moving it through the digital forensics process. And, and hopefully I've allowed um, everybody just to get an insight into how we can take digital forensics as a discipline and how we can apply uh, the forensic science processes within that. I think most of us will actually find, um, if we look at hindsight in the cases that we've investigated, that most of us have actually applied these processes and principles without even realizing that we've done it, because it's almost uh, second nature. And a lot of it has been built into the training that we've received, um, the mentoring that we've received from other examiners. Um, but it's important from a, from a process and principle point of view to understand where the forensic science meets the digital forensics especially if we end up going to, to court on a matter where, where digital forensic evidence is often treated as forensic science evidence. And if we can talk the language of forensic scientists when it comes to those environments, it could certainly enhance our, um, our value in the court process and the investigative process. So, so Carol, um, over to you. I don't know if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, if they, if there are questions, I am open to answering any questions that anybody might have. All right, thanks, Jason. Yes, we do have a few questions from the audience. However, if anyone has a question, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first one asks, uh, which tools do you recommend using? I, I I get this quite often when it comes to um, doing anything forensic related. Um, so so without sounding um, uh, facetious, uh, the best tool, the absolute, absolute, absolute best tool that I recommend using when you're doing digital forensics is the one that is just sort of sits on top of our neck and between our ears. Um, and that's that's the brain. Um, and I, I know this sounds, it sounds, you know, like I'm almost like uh, making fun of the question. It's actually not because the brain and asking questions is actually our most valuable tool. Um, and the reason I say that is because if you don't understand the artifact, so for example, uh, you don't understand file systems, for example, on a Windows system, and you don't understand how data works and how applications work and, and programs work and how, how do you know if the tool that you're using is actually accurate? Now, um, I, I come from a, a, an age of doing digital forensics where we literally started out with hex editors. Um, and, and, and to be honest, uh, you could have a hex editor and you could do as much forensics as you can with the most expensive digital forensics tools out there. 
it's not pretty it's not um you know it's not uh, uh they're not always easy to use but they'll still get the results uh, the job done so i suppose the best advice i can give in terms of saying what's the best tool or what are the best tools that i use pick the tool that's best for your artifact now I do want to make a shout out to to a friend of mine and fellow SANS instructor, Eric Zimmerman. Um, Eric Zimmerman is a prolific digital forensics tool writer. And, and I've, I think most people doing digital forensics um, have used one or more of Eric's tools. Um, and, and one of the benefits of Eric's tools and why they work as well as they do is Eric really understands the artifacts. So he builds tools for, for um, particular artifact. So if you haven't tried any of Eric's tools, I would seriously recommend going and having a look at them. Um, from a from a, a, a general practitioner point of view, uh, the, the company that I work at, uh, we use all of Eric's tools. We also use all of the commercial tools. Um, in fact, we probably have pretty much one of every tool out there just in case we need it on a case. Um, so the best advice I can say is what is the, what are the best tools is the, the ones that you feel the most comfortable with and the ones that you can validate are doing the job correctly. All right, thank you. What are some of the factors to consider when doing data file reconstruction? So, so when it comes to data file reconstruction, so um, we in the four five hundred course we have a whole section on on file carving, um, and I, I want to sort of split it into two sections. We talk about this concept called file carving, and then we call about stream carving. Now, um, stream carving is a little bit little bit different from file carving because effectively you're looking for structured data either inside other files that you can recover. So. Uh, things like running a regex query for a credit card number or a regex query against unallocated space for an IP address or things along those lines. Um, but when it comes to, to actual file recovery, um, the, the two factors that you need to bear in mind is uh, whether or not the, the metadata for the file itself is intact. So for example, if it's on a NTFS system, the record for that file that you're trying to recover still exists. So there will be a master file table record for that file, uh, which will indicate what clusters that the, the data for that file is actually contained in. Um, think, of, think of the master file table as a roadmap to physically where the data is on the hard drive. And if I have that, I can effectively go to those clusters, uh, copy those clusters out, reconstruct them, and basically recover the full file. Um, the problem is, and this is probably this is a factor that comes into play, is that if you don't have that and you're doing uh, file recovery, you're basically looking at files or you're looking at data at the beginning of cluster boundaries on a hard drive, on a file system, um, because a file has to start at a cluster boundary. Um, and you're basically then carving out each, like one cluster at a time and hoping that you find the complete file. But the problem is if the file is fragmented, um, you're never going to know if, you know, so I'll, I'll carve out file, you know, cluster one and the header for cluster one says uh, this is a JPEG file and I get to cluster two and I don't see a file header so I assume that it's part of that JPEG file and I get to uh, cluster three and suddenly I see a file header for a Word document um, and I then say, okay, this JPEG file only consists of clusters one and two, but it might actually consist of more than two clusters but I don't get to see the rest of the clusters because it's fragmented. So, so when you're doing file recovery, I think that's the key thing to be looking at is whether or not um, you, know, you, you have the ability to recover the whole file, either because the clusters are contiguous or you have the metadata for that file um, still available for your, uh, for your use, uh, or you have to face the realistic probability that you're only going to be able to recover fragments of the file. All right, thank you. Someone asks, isn't it more difficult now than the past to analyze disks because the density of them is an obstacle for digital forensics? Um, I, I would say yes and no. Uh, the reason I say uh, yes, it's an obstacle is that if you take the old mechanism of saying, um, uh, examine the entire hard drive, um, you know, you, you're probably realistically not going to have the time to examine a whole hard drive. So, so just to give you an example to put it into perspective, um, 
let's just say uh, you know a a, a a one gig of data is basically the equivalent of uh, two hundred twelve thousand pages, sort of letter pages of information. You know, so if you consider an average hard drive being uh, one thousand twenty-four gigs of data, um, that is uh, some quickly two hundred seventeen million pages of information. So, so, so you know, we're moving from one terabyte to two terabyte to four terabyte. I mean, there's already people looking at sixteen terabyte drives. Um, being able to do full disk forensics um, is it's not cost effective to do it these days, um, just simply because of the size of the drives. But on the counter of that, it's also not uh, its not a negative thing either if you understand the system. So we, we've often taught in the, the 500 course and the 508 that 99% that of the data you get in any investigation comes between sort of 1 to 5 to 10% of the actual hard drive. So, so if you know how data is structured, you'll know where to get the most um, effective data to prove your cases. Now, does that mean that you might miss some evidence? Yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm completely uh, cognizant of that fact. But the reality is, is that you will still find the most likely evidence. And, and to sort of illustrate this, I want to I use another sort of real world physical analogy. Um, uh, let's just say, you know, next next week I'll be at the, the DFIL summit in, in Austin, Texas, and somebody really, really doesn't like my training. So in the middle of the night, somebody comes into my hotel room, bashes me over the head with my laptop, and the next day the cleaning staff find me in my hotel room. Um, and they call the police in. You know, the, the police come in and they're going to, they, they're going to come and seal off the room in the hotel where I stay. That's going to be the crime scene. Um, they're not going to seal off necessarily the whole hotel. You know, they're not going to they're not going to put the entire hotel in an evidence bag and examine every single room in the hotel. They're going to examine the room where there is most likely to be evidence. And if that leads them to other rooms, they might examine other rooms. And, and I think that's the that's the shift that we have to make when we're doing digital forensics these days is we can't we can no longer do the approach of we're going to investigate every single thing on the hard drive. We now need to investigate where we most likely going to find the relevant evidence. Um, and it's one of the reasons why uh, SANS has also introduced the 498 course that um, written by Eric Zimmerman and Kevin Ripper uh, that are actually looking at um, how do we get to that evidence? How do we get to that evidence quicker? So, so yes, bigger hard drives do make our lives more difficult. But if we know what we're looking for, it shouldn't actually compromise our ability to investigate effectively.